would like to talk to you today about the beautiful gospel for beggars. Okay? And we're going to turn in our King James Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2 in the Old Testament. And we're going to see what proper praise is and how it includes the idea of a beggar. Um, because being a beggar is a very important part of salvation. We'll get to that as we continue in this study. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. We'll get back to that. To set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. Remember that too. <laughs> the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Very important verse, or passage here, verses 1 through 10. Uh, really an encouragement today with all that's going on, and all the stuff, the dark clouds upon the horizon, as it were, um, the persecution that's going to come to the body of Christ. Don't forget how powerful God is, and how powerful the Lord can, is, and he can knock down people and bring people up, and, and he can take care of you and whatever else. But the key verse there, verse 8, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. Are you poor when you get saved? Yeah. Do you have any heavenly riches as a, as a lost person? No, you don't. You're poor. You're needy. And you have to come to that point of understanding that. And not come in, in pride and, and arrogance and just simply say, uh, Well, I'm a Christian because I was raised in church. I'm a Christian because I've, I believe that I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because I spoke some little prayer or whatever else. No, you need to think about a few things there. Okay? You need to come to the Lord broken. Uh, you can't have any self-righteousness when you get saved. When you come to the Lord to be saved, I'll say it that way. But look what it says here. And lifteth up the beggar from the dung hill. Very telling because if you go over to the New Testament, we're not going to go there, but... You can go over the New Testament, and Paul is speaking about his life as a Pharisee before the Lord saved him. And what does he say? I count all things but dung, that I may win Christ. Hmm. He lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. What was the condition of the Apostle Paul when God saved him? Oh, sitting in the city of Damascus, hadn't eaten in a couple days, and he was blind. Probably there, I'm, I'm sure he was praying quite fervently to the Lord. What am I supposed to do? What am I going to do? You know, He was waiting on the Lord to save him. Very interesting. But uh, Paul had some pride, or Saul at the time, he had some pride that needed to be broken before the Lord would save him. And I'll tell you right now, if, uh, if you're not saved, um, you need to come to a point where your pride is broken. And you don't trust in yourself anymore. Okay, you might want to say almost a position of a beggar. Let's continue. Luke chapter 16. Go to the New Testament, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 25. It says here, there was a certain rich man, hmm, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. A certain what? Beggar. Remember that. 
and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Okay? Um, so there you have a very interesting story that the Lord told. And it was not a parable. It doesn't call it a parable. It's a story. The Lord knows who went to hell and who's you know, in Abraham's bosom at that point in time before they're able to go up to heaven. You can watch other studies on that. I'm not going to get into that whole thing there. But uh, you see this monetized man, I mean, uh, excuse me, <laughs> rich man in hell. Um, why did he get to hell? Because he wasn't about to beg. His pride was too strong. Why was Lazarus in Abraham's bosom? Because he was a beggar, you see. And I'm sure as a beggar, the thought of uh, being saved was very attractive to him. And um, that's really what this whole study is about. There are a lot of people out there that, that claim salvation and they even preach gospels of salvation, but they're false. They're fake. Why? Because their pride is so great that they can't bring themselves to a place in time where they can fall down on their knees and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. They call upon the name of the Lord. You see, they don't like that. Acts chapter 3. Let's go there. See, if you don't come to the Lord as a broken sinner, the Lord's just not going to save you. He's not interested in it. The Lord doesn't want a bunch of self-righteous people. Say, well, I'm not self-righteous. I believe the gospel. Okay, um, so then what saved you? Did your uh, belief in the gospel save you or did God save you? What is it that saves you? That's the whole point here. Well, my belief. I, I believe, so therefore I am. You know, oh, okay. It sounds a little bit new agey to me. Um, well, I believe the gospel, but I call it upon the Lord and He saved me because I asked him to save me. It's a normal thing. Okay, we'll get into more of this as we continue. But Acts chapter 3, we'll see another beggar here. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. We'll read the whole chapter. Now Peter and John went up together unto the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So he was very much like Lazarus, except they didn't lay, you know, this Lazarus was laid at a rich man's, the gate of a rich man's house. This man here was laid at the temple going in and he was asking for money. Verse 3, Who seeing Peter and John asked, about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifteth, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the, lame man, as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Okay, understand something here. Just We'll get back to this in just a minute. But when Jesus Christ goes up, he says, I'm going to give you signs to confirm the word to the Jews. That's why they're there in the temple. All right? They're there in a Jewish temple. So these sign gifts that were given of, of instantaneous and miraculous healing, those were given to the apostles. Okay, Those gifts were given there to confirm the word to the Jews because the Jews require a sign. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But let's continue here. Verse 12, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, 
Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though we, as though by our own power or holiness he, we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, with our fathers, excuse me, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Hmm. You're always going to see this in the New Testament. There's always the judgment of sin in terms of salvation. It's always going to be there. You need to feel guilt for your sins before God will save you. Period. And you're not going to be able to turn from those sins. That's There's a wicked thing out there called Lordship Salvation, which says turns from, turn from your sins, and then God saves you later on. That's not possible. You need to get saved as a sinner, understanding that you're a sinner, understanding that you deserve hell. Kind of like a beggar. You're poor. You're needy. You're on the ground saying, God, please help me. You know, there's going to be a lot of beggars coming out here soon, the way that this country's headed. So many people with uh, they can't pay their mortgage, can't pay their rent, can't pay their bills. They lost their jobs because of a phony virus. A lot of people are going to be reduced to beggars. And the beautiful truth of the matter is those people will have a real good chance to get saved because before they were just too self-righteous. Hey, I don't need God. I don't need God's help. Oh, uh, you will in the future. But what's this whole chapter about here? It's showing the reoccurring theme all, all throughout the scriptures. You have to be broken. You have to have problems. And you have to call out to God and say, I need your help. It's just natural. A little baby cries. Why? Pick me up, Dad. Pick me up, Mom. I need help. I have a dirty diaper. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I need this. I'm, I'm cold. I, I'm too hot. I... It's a natural thing. The child just doesn't sit there and just stare at the, their parents. No, they cry. A beggar cries out to God. These Jews were self-righteous. Out here's a beggar. How many people walked right by him? Homeless man out here, basically, you know, and he's out here asking for alms. Please, can you give me money? Could just a little bit? Could you spare a little bit of change? And they come out and say, this is the right kind of guy here to get saved. Hey, everybody, you want to see what you have to be to get saved? Here, look at this guy. And what happens? Chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. The self-righteous religious leaders got angry about it. Just like a lot of self-righteous religious leaders out there get mad at preachers like myself that preach the true gospel of being broken, repentance unto salvation. 
oh, there's no need for that. You don't have to feel bad about yourself. You don't have to think about your sins. You don't have to call upon the name of the Lord. You can just believe in your heart. You just believe the gospel. Good. Boom. You say, I declare I'm saved. Boom. These guys would put me in prison if they could. Look what happened. Verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Huh. 5,000 self-righteous Jews in the synagogue. And the disciples perform this miracle. Here's this guy out here begging. A beggar. And he's begging, help me. Please help me. And they say, here's some help for you. Boom. Heal him. Come on in. Let's preach the gospel to these people. They're showing you a pattern there. A pattern that a sinner needs to be broken. And it's beautiful. It's not some kind of a horrible thing. You're admitting the honest truth about yourself and your lack of a personal relationship with God, with your Creator. And the Lord says, I'll take you. Hey, smelly, sweaty, homeless person laying out on the street and they're saying, help me, help me. Hear the gospel? You can be saved. God will save you today. God, please save me. The Lord doesn't, is not going to look down from heaven and say, oh, Oh, ooh, uh, yeah, you're, you need to take a shower before I'll save you. Uh, how much money do you have again? Ugh, oh, I don't know if this would be a good investment for me. I'm going to have to have a security do you know, deposit before I might even think of saving. No. You're a beggar? You have nothing? Have no future? Things are looking pretty bleak? I'll save you. Oh, you're self-righteous? You don't want to lower yourself to a position of a beggar. You don't want to call upon me. You don't want to even talk to me for me to get my salvation that I'm offering to you. You're just going to come and take the salvation without even saying a word to me. God speaking. Not interested. That goes contrary to the message of this book. Mark chapter 10. Go to Mark chapter 10 in the King James Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Another beggar? Mm -hmm. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. Shh, be quiet, shut up. That's what they're saying to him. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Well, there's some beautiful pictures of salvation there. Your filthy rags is, is your righteousness. He casts away his garment and he comes to Jesus. Hmm. But it started with him calling out to the Lord. Verse 51, And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind, re the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Oh, hey, Jesus, hey, thanks so much for giving me my sight you know, back. I'll see you around. Thanks. I'll never forget you, buddy. It's not what he did. He followed Jesus. Are you prepared to follow Jesus if you're lost? The Lord saves you. He's going to purchase you. And he's going to tell you what to do with your life. See? Again, that's why the phony professing Christians out there, they don't, they don't want that. They don't want that kind of a thing. Oh, you got to follow Jesus. Oh, you got to start being obedient to his word. Oh, you have to give up this and you have to give up that. And life of sanctification. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, is there some other way I can do it? Oh, sure, friend. All you got to do is just believe. Believe and send in your donation, and which is 501c3 tax deductible to our church here, or, you know, and things. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm not saying you don't support ministries. That's fine. But what I'm saying is these guys, they don't want to tell you anything about sin. The vast majority of false preachers out there will never convict you of your sin. 
It's just a general understanding. We're all sinners. All you have to do, Jesus died on the cross. He paid it all on the cross. Just believe it. You don't have to talk to God. You don't have to come as a beggar and cry unto the Lord. Get around your relatives. Hey, I don't know. Something's going wrong. I, I, need, to, I need to understand the Bible or the gospel. Oh, shut up. You don't, you don't even know what you're talking about. Just don't, don't get into this religious stuff, whatever else. No, I'm serious. I need to know. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to know how to go to heaven when I die. I need to be saved. God, I, I need to know the truth. How do I get saved? You're coming to him as a beggar, you see. You ask God to save you because you believe the Bible. You believe the gospel. You see it and you say, okay, I want to get in contact with the man that wrote this book. You say, is it, is it uh, Brian Dunlinger? No, absolutely not. Well, the translators of the King James Bible, no, they didn't write this book. They translated it. Who wrote the book? God. This book is about Jesus Christ. You better get in contact with him. But you come in the right broken state. You come as a beggar. See? It's a beautiful thing. He accepts you. He'll take you in. Just the way you are. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Gotta love that. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He came as a beggar. Broken, publican, a tax collector, a tax man, a government official. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know everything I've done. You know the people that I've caused to lose their homes. You know the, the horrors and the bad, th the corrupt, twisted things. God, you know it all. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Pharisee, I'm not that bad. I'm actually a pretty good person. I fast twice in the week. I'm not as other people. Mm -hmm. Self-righteous versus broken beggar. Hmm. And what happened? Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What's more humbling than being a beggar? You lose everything. I've seen videos of these people that are homeless, and they've been homeless many times for years. Where'd you sleep last night? under the bridge um, how are your shoes well they got a lot of holes in them and you know when did you eat last oh, probably two days ago I guess I don't really know I'm just what are you gonna do I don't know they're humble you see it humbles you and for a lot of people there's gonna be a lot of homeless people coming up and see the preachers will tell you hey Come on into the church and everything else. Bring your tithes and, and bring your good attendance and do this. And we're going to do give, give, give to the church. Well, I'm homeless. What should I do? Oh, well, maybe you could go to a shelter someplace and whatever else. You see? Um, and, and if you just want to be saved, all you have to do is just, just pray this quick little prayer and you're in. Well, what is sin? What is the cross? Oh, don't worry about any of that stuff. They don't explain it to you. Pray a quick prayer and you're in. That's what some do. That's... One of the big false gospels out there. There's no conviction of sin there. Another one is the thing of just belief. It's just a mental, sort of a new age type of a thing where you just envision that you are saved and therefore you are. Uh, you say, oh, I know the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross for sinners. Okay, I believe that. Are you saved? Sure. Why? I declared it of myself. You see? Very convenient because you don't have to be lowered you don't have to humble yourself before the Lord. Hmm. I deal with these people a lot. These self-righteous people. Acts chapter 9. Turn to 
turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. Start in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, in other words, any that were Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Refer to this earlier. Here he is, self-righteous Pharisee. He's the, like the guy in the temple there that can't, comes in and he's making fun of the public. And, you know, he's fasting twice in the week and the whole deal. Paul was a very high-level religious authority. He was going around putting Christians in prison. And the Lord comes out and he says, you know, what you're doing here is not good, essentially, is what he's saying to him. And... You know, the light's so bright and Paul's trembling. Paul's scared to death. Again, think of all these things. What is the Lord making Paul into? He's breaking Paul's pride and making him into a beggar. What's the condition of the Apostle Paul? He can't see. He hasn't eaten. Probably not slept very good. He's there. Do you think he cares about cleanliness or whatever? He is there and he is totally broken. Verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Do you think he was praying? Of course he was praying. Do you think he's calling upon the Lord to be saved? Of course he's calling upon the Lord to be saved. There's no intellectual envisioning and, and imagining. and That stuff's not even there. Gospel of a beggar, you see. God, please save me. God, please, if, you, if you'll take care of me, please give me my eyesight back, Lord. I'm so sorry for what I was doing. Three days. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand up on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Hmm. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Hmm. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. What a changed life. But how did it come? A self-righteous Pharisee had to be knocked down and turned into a beggar. He had to have his pride crushed. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't want to have the thought of saying, you know what? My life is not going anywhere. I'm broken. I'm ruined. God, if you're real, please help me. Help me. I need help. You see? False preachers will tell you you don't have to beg. You don't have to get to that point of being a, a beggar. Just come in your pride. Come in your self-righteousness. Oh, sure, yeah, we all sin, don't we? Of course we do. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and all you got to do is just believe that. That's it. 
Don't have to ask him. You don't have to come to God broken. They're lying to you. Psalm 86. Back to the Old Testament. Psalm 86. Verses 5 through 7. For thou, Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. I'll give you two little analogies, a way to illustrate this. Let's just say I'm standing here and all of a sudden this bookshelf here behind me falls down and crushes me and I have a broken bone. I'm just going to lay there and I'm going to say, the ambulance is on its way. I'm, I believe in the ambulance. I believe in the crew on the ambulance. I believe in the hospital to be able to fix my broken bones. I believe fully by faith that the ambulance will be here soon. <laughs> uh, no. Um, hey, call an ambulance. Call 911. I'm hurt bad. Uh, well, you know, I didn't say, hey, hey, call down the road to the pizza parlor. Get them over here quickly. I think that they can heal me. Uh, no. Call 911 because I need help. I believe that they can come and help me. But it does me no good with my belief if I don't call, you see. Have you ever had to call 911? It's a, it's a humbling experience. You're hurt. Hurt bad. I mean, as a man, you know, most men don't like to admit to being hurt. But you get hurt really bad and you say, I, I think I need an ambulance. I think I need help. Get an ambulance here quick. Oh, man, I'm hurt really bad. I've only had it a few times in my life, but it's it's been, you know, and I've been in a lot of bad accidents and things with, you know, I had a bad logging accident the one time thought I was paralyzed. And I said, we got to get to the hospital. I think I'm hurt bad. That was a humbling experience. And I went there basically like a beggar. Please help me. Another time I almost cut my thumb off. <laughs> Had to go in to the hospital. Most times I avoid hospitals. But, you know, the whole point is you have to humble yourself. <laughs> well, I'm fine. I'm okay. I don't need any help. You see the difference there? No. When you understand I have a problem. Okay. There's somebody I believe that could help me. I better call them. I better talk to them. Right now, how many Americans are thinking that they don't need any help from God? They're not in a desperate situation. Verse 7, In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Hey, uh, average American, are you in trouble? I don't know. It's not that bad. I mean, they're going to be printing out these new stimulus checks soon and we're going to be able to maybe get unemployment again. And I think the economy is going to reopen up and I think everything's going to be just fine. Wait a month or two or a couple months. Um, wars broken out in America. Uh, powers fluctuating on and off in places and there's all kinds of rioting and looting and, and lockdowns and martial law in the streets and forced vaccinations and all kinds of things. And all of a sudden you find yourself out there on the streets, hungry, cold, sick, who knows what. And all of a sudden you remember, hey, you know what? There's a God up there. God, you're the only hope I have. God, can you help me? God, can you save me? The Bible says that uh, here in these end times, uh, the body of Christ is going to end in apostasy. There's not going to be many people that are truly saved when the Lord catches up his body. Um, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's a great multitude that gets saved, which no man could number. And you don't want to know why I believe that is? Because God has to reduce them to a level of beggars. A lot, right now, a lot of these people, in their pride... Their self-righteous, conceited pride, they will never lower themselves to get down on their knees and cry out to God and shed some actual real tears and just say, God, I'm worthless. I'm useless. I'm such a wicked sinner. God, I can't stand this life anymore. Please, God, save me or I'm just going to blow my brains out or something. Lord, I can't take this anymore. 
No, no, oh my, no. They don't want that. They want to go to a nice little church someplace with nice little social things for the kids and, and all this other stuff. Broken? Oh, no. I, no, thank you. No, thank you. Don't like that. I mean, I've literally talked to people. We used to go door to door and things um, and uh, go out there and, and, and I'd get this thing. I'm good. I'm good. I think, you know, you have your beliefs. I have mine. Say, yeah, okay, I, I understand that, sir, but uh, could you please show me your release in the scriptures? I, I, I know, I know, I respect your opinion, but you know, get get off my lawn, okay? I think I'm going to be fine. I'm good, I'm good. They're not beggars, you see. They're prideful, self-righteous people. God's going to have to break them. In the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, one of the, the best books that kind of lines up with what God's going to do to the Jews, especially in the time of Jacob's trouble, is the book of Job. Here they are, wealthy, all kinds of things and connections and everybody else and or everything else. And they, they have the right political connections. People respected Job. And all of a sudden, bam, it's all taken from him. And he's out on the ground. My kids are all dead. They stole everything that I had. I, what in the world? And the devil goes back to the Lord, gets permission, comes back, bam, takes Job's, Job's health away. And what was Job? Sitting out there in the dust, down on his knees, a beggar. Why? Because Job had a bit too much pride. And Job was a good man. You read about that. Job was a great man. He had just a little bit too much self-righteousness. Hmm. If you don't want to be broken... You know, and you're just doing the belief thing. I believe in whatever else. I don't have to come to God as a broken sinner and call out to Him. God's going to have to do something in your life to break that pride. And it's coming. It's coming very fast in the future. Romans chapter 10. Go back to the New Testament to Romans chapter 10. Satan hates this passage. Tell you that right now. I've seen this thing for so many years as a as a preacher. I started preaching in in Baptist churches back in 2007, and I got on YouTube in 2000, late 2008, and re didn't really do much with preaching until about 2009 or so. But I've uh, been around for a while, and um, you know, raised in the whole church building thing and and whatever else. And uh, I've seen down through the years that uh, the devil will mess with certain passages. His ministers will mess with certain passages. And Romans chapter 10 is one of the favorite places to go for ministers of Satan to mess it up. Because it's just so crystal clear how to get saved. And they'll say, well, you know, well, I'll show you here. Romans chapter 10, beginning, beginning in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Okay? And in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith. You get saved by grace. God's grace through faith. Faith is your part that you play in salvation. You can't die on the cross. Your blood doesn't mean anything. Okay, Your blood isn't going to wash away any sins. Jesus Christ's blood does. The blood of God washes away your sins. All right. Um, your righteousness means nothing to God. Your good works mean nothing to God in terms of your salvation, saving you from eternity in hell. Uh, what is it? Your faith in what Jesus Christ did. God's grace has to be there to come to you. Okay? But these things, the gospel, it's nigh thee, it's near to you, it's even in your mouth. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess him with your mouth. I don't want to be my own savior anymore. God I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins. Confessing with your mouth, you see. You say, well, that's all there is? Oh, no. Continue. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. Hey, beggar. Hey, poor, wicked sinner down there in the dirt. Made a mess of your life. You want to get saved? Yeah. Do you believe what the Bible says about Jesus dying on the cross? Well, of course I do. Well, then all you have to do is just come to me and I'll give you salvation. 
Do you just join my church? Just become a member of my website. We'll get them the forms. And it... No, it doesn't work that way. You go to God to save you. Come before the Lord as a broken sinner and just say, God, I believe this book right here. It says that Jesus Christ died on the cross and then he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This book is nigh me. It's right here. I can read it. I believe the record that you gave of, of your son. Please, God, save me. According to the scriptures, according to thy word, save me. Please, God, I don't want to go to hell. I'm scared. See? You see how the devil messes with this whole thing? The devil's ministers come along and they say, all you have to do is just believe. There's, no, there's nothing that comes out of your mouth. A little bell goes off. Ding! I saved. I'm saved. Why, how do you know? Well, because I just believe. So it's all about you then. You see? The devil says, believe without confessing. And then the other one is, knock, knock at the door. Here's the Baptist missionary. And he says, okay, friend, would you like to go to heaven when you die? Okay, all you have to do is just say this faith-saving prayer. And blah, 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 blah. And the, and the person's saying, okay, I don't really know. I have a lot of questions here. Why am I getting, what am I getting saved from? Why, am, why do I need to be saved? It, it, but okay, I'll just do what this thing is, you know, or, or I went to this Easter service or something and I, I saw this little beautiful play and they say, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you'd like to know for sure that you'll go to heaven when you die, I've heard it a few times, would you please pray this prayer? Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. Okay, no one looking around. All right. Dear Lord Jesus, please pray it with me. And everybody says, Dear Lord Jesus. And they don't believe it for one minute. They have no understanding. So see how Satan's ministers come? They get people to confess without believing. And they get to people to believe without confessing. You have to do both. Again, my analogy from earlier. Bookshelf falls on me. I'm hurt. I need help. I believe that the people from the ambulance crew can help me. But it does me no good until I call them. Until I beg them, please come quickly. I'm not going to get on the phone and say, hey, you know, I am can feel, you know, my lungs starting to fill with blood here, but do you just take your time. I'll, I'll be all right. You know, no, please get here as quickly as you can. I'm in a lot of pain. Begging. Begging. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He's rich. <laughs> Again, hey people, you're going to lose everything in the future. If you haven't already, you're going to lose things. There's going to be famine, pestilence. War and rumors of war. All these things are coming. Why? Because Jesus Christ said so in his word. You're going to lose a lot. The economy is falling apart as I speak right now. Oh no, it's never been better. Then why are they having to inject billions and billions of dollars into it? Even before the whole coronavirus thing, when they shut people's businesses down, injecting all this money into you know, quantitative easing into the economy. It's going to be very bad, you see. You lose everything. What would you need to find? Oh, probably somebody that'd be rich. You're a beggar. Wouldn't it be nice to find somebody that's rich that you could call out to them and say, hey, I need some help. How about calling out to the richest man in the universe? God, the Lord of glory, walks in a city that has streets made of gold. Not a bunch of toxic chemical pavement, tar and whatever else that they mix together. No, he walks on gold. Maybe you ought to call upon him as a beggar. Verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, rich over all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Obviously, like we talked about, you believe that Jesus died on the cross. You believe the record that God gave of his son. And you say, I believe this. God, I'm trusting what your word says. I need help. Please. You're out there. You're on the street. You're a beggar. And somebody comes up and they say, here, I have something for you. You say, oh, is it money? No. 
here's a here's a card. I want you to take this card. This belongs to a, a very wealthy friend of mine. He'll help you. He helps people like you. All you got to do is just call him. You want it? He'll get you out of your situation. You look at the card and you say, Okay, I believe that he helped me. No, you, you call and you say, Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm going to call as soon as I can. And you go, you find a phone someplace. You call the number, your hands are shaking. And he says, hello? Sir, I need help. I need help really bad. I lost everything. I'm homeless. I don't know what I'm going to do for my next meal. I don't, I, I don't know where I'm going to live. I, please, please, can you help me? Sounds like you're a beggar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm a beggar. I lost it all. Please, can you help me? Yes, I'll help you. I'll save you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what God does for wicked sinners like you and me. Finally, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. There's that calling again. Hmm. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there's a whole lot of stuff in those verses right there. But there's six things I want to show you. Okay, there's more. We could go over some more. But I'm just going to show you six main things there of true, real conversion. Not the intellectual belief. Not a vain prayer of salvation. Okay, but believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth. And God saves you. All right, And the question has to be asked, and this is so important, your salvation right now, is it of God or is it intellectual? Is it all up here? Have you experienced genuine saving faith? Okay, number one, you see peace. Verse three, grace, unto you, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace? You know what you need when you're a beggar? You need peace. That's one of the things that you want more than anything else. Number two, enriched by him in utterance. Notice that. Verse five, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. You know what one of the biggest things that will change when you genuinely get born again? Your speech. I see a lot of these very wicked people out there and they just swear just profanity just flows freely out of the mouth. When you truly get born again, something changes. It's like a light switch goes off. And all of a sudden, not only do you start to clean up your own speech, and you know, occasionally somebody will let a word fly, I get it, but then it's, oh, I'm sorry. But all of a sudden, the speech of the lost world out there, that vile, wicked profanity that you hear, all of a sudden it starts to vex your righteous soul. And you say, you know, I really don't want to hear that anymore. I don't want to hear the dirty jokes. I don't want to hear that profanity. You are enriched. God will start to do things in your life. He'll enrich you in all uh, utterance and in all knowledge. Hmm. The next one, number three, the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. Verse six, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. What does that mean? Jesus Christ died on the cross. He's buried and he rises again from the dead. Um, when you get saved, you can read about this in Romans chapter 6. We're not going to go there for sake of time. But when you get saved, your old man dies with Jesus Christ and Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. So now you're not walking around in your own self-righteousness. Now you're walking around with the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you. 
And that testimony has to be confirmed. It's not some kind of a thing of, of well, yo, I'm, I'm sure I'm saved, and you just go on living like a wicked, lost person. I mean, the modern Christian system, those people are just so vile and so wicked, they're, they're, there's no difference between them and lost people. That testimony of Christ is not there. All right, number four, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are present. You'll see that. Uh, verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean the sign gifts that were given to confirm the word of the Jews. Uh, you're not going to see that today with the thing of divine miraculous healing where they lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. You don't see that. Uh, the speaking in unknown languages. The Bible calls it tongues or languages. Just instantaneous, you know the, another language and can speak it perfectly. All right, You get around a bunch of Jews and all of a sudden you just start, boom, speaking perfect Hebrew. See, um, that's not there. Now, there is this thing of the speaking of tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. That's there. There are Christians that have a gift for learning languages much quicker than other people. But it's not the sign gift miraculous, boom, and you can speak in Hebrew. No, you can. there are some people that are very good at learning languages. So that is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there is a gift of healings as well, plural. Not divine miraculous, touch the person and they're better. No, there's a gift of natural healing of herbology, of um, nutrition, of teaching people how to get pro proper rest. And, and there's a lot of different things that you can do there as far as having gifts from the Holy Spirit to heal people. Certainly. But again, are those gifts there? You say, well, I, I'm a Christian. I, I, I know I got saved because I believe the facts of the, the gospel. Okay, did you confess with your mouth? Did you come to him as a beggar and beg the Lord and ask him to save you? Are these signs there? The next one is sanctification in verse 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's confirming you. The Lord says, okay, I bought you. You're my property. Now I'm going to modify your life. You buy some vehicle out there, you say, I'm going to modify this vehicle to be better suited to my purposes. I bought this Jeep and I'm going to take it off road. So I need to consider buying this and I need to consider putting that on it and changing this and changing that. You see? The Lord says, hey, I purchased you with my own blood and I'm going to have you go out there and I'm going to help you have, you know, have you help people with their health, we'll say. And so the Lord starts to say, I'm going to teach you about this sickness by letting you get it and letting you understand how to heal it. I'm going to teach you about this. I'm going to teach you about that. He's confirming you unto the end. The Lord doesn't say, hey, uh, you got saved because you believe the gospel? Great. Fine. Okay. Well, we'll see you at the you know, rapture, we'll see you in some, no, he does things in your life to confirm that your conversion was real. Okay. And finally, fellowship of Jesus Christ. You see that in um, verse nine, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you have fellowship with Jesus Christ? I mean, it just always cracks me up. Oh, you don't have to pray to get saved. These people that, that do this thing. Okay. Um, then when do you start praying? <laughs> Uh, you mentally assent to the facts of the gospel, and then you just simply say, okay, I'm saved now. Hey, God, now that I'm saved, now that I've you know saved myself with my own thoughts, I'd like to ask you to just start doing some things in my life. No, you come to the Lord and you get saved. My analogy earlier, the guy gives you a card. You're out there, you're a homeless beggar, gives you a card. Hey, call this guy. The guy comes and he says, hey, I'm going to send you some money right away. Well, thank you. And, and call me tomorrow and let me know when it gets there. You establish your relationship. You have to start the call, but then that guy establishes a personal relationship and he eventually comes and gets you. Just the way it is with a, somebody that gets saved. You establish a relationship by calling out to the Lord for the first time. And when he saves you, he expects to hear from you. Fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. And you'll see as you get older as a Christian, you'll see some of the stuff the Lord went through when he was here on the earth. And the Lord will put you through the same thing. You'll have people that you think are friends that are listening to you. When you read the Bible, they're like disciples. And all of a sudden, you'll have a Judas Iscariot that stabs you in the back. You'll have a Peter that just misrepresents what you were trying to say and sticks his foot in his mouth, you know, kind of a thing. You'll have a John that's like a disciple that you love. You'll have friends and family not believe your testimony. 
The Lord will put you through those things. Why? Because he's trying to establish fellowship between you and him. So you have relatability. You say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I can't say I have all these things. Okay, then did you follow the formula for salvation in Romans chapter 10? Do you really believe the gospel? Or did you just say the prayer because that's what you, your church said to do? Do you understand what the point of salvation is? You see? Or is it that you didn't even pray a prayer? You just said, I'm not going to beg for salvation. I don't need to beg. I don't need to ask God to save me. I don't need to call out to the Lord, even though Romans chapter 10 says you do. Um, I can just believe the facts of the gospel. I don't need to call or ask or anything. Well, then that's why you're not seeing these things in your life. Again, if you are genuinely saved, you will have peace. You will be enriched by Him. You will have the testimony of Christ confirmed in you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit will be present. There will be a sanctification in your life. And number six, you'll have fellowship with God. Not only praying to Him, but the Lord will put you through some things that will be similar to what Jesus Christ went through. It's a very important message, brethren, um, because there are Satanists out there that will try to mess up the gospel. They'll get you to pray with your mouth without believing, without understanding the necessity of you getting saved and why God is judging you as a sinner. And then the other flip side of the coin is there are people that will say, all you have to do is believe. It's either a quick prayer or just believe. That's two satanic systems. No repentance of sin, no conviction of sin, no really understanding what you're even doing. Just pray this prayer. Just repeat this prayer and you get to go to heaven. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you get to go to heaven when you die. False system number one. False system number two. You don't need to ask God to save you. And don't come to Him as a beggar. Don't come to Him broken. See? God doesn't expect that. All you have to do is just believe. Just believe. Well, then you're rejecting the very words of God. The simple plan of salvation. And that's why you see these both groups, when you really look at them, they're missing peace. Their speech isn't different than the lost world. You hear them using profanity. They don't have the testimony of Christ. There's no old man and now new man. A lot of these people are false converts because they'll say, I got saved as a young child or something like this. Well, okay, where's the testimony of Christ? Where's, could you tell me how the old man died when you were two years old and got saved? <laughs> how does that even work? Okay, there are no gifts of the Holy Spirit. They'll never talk to you about natural health or they'll never talk to you about um, whatever. The gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't present in their life. Um, there's no sanctification. Again, where's the abstinence from the, the lost world? Where's the warning about that? Where's the preaching on sin? Very few of them do it. And uh, fellowship of Jesus Christ? They don't have it. The duty of man is to get to know his Creator. That's your whole duty. That's the whole purpose. So what's the purpose of life? This mystical thing that's out there that people have to kind of do pilgrimages. And, no, you don't need to do any of that stuff. You need to come to the point where you realize God created this world and I need to get to know Him. And um, you'll have to get to a point where you'll have to beg the Lord to save you. I've never known one person, never known one that didn't beg the Lord to save him. That didn't get to a point of being a beggar and saying, I'm just at the end of, of the line here. I, I need to get saved. God, would you please save me? I'm needy. I don't know what my future is. I mean, you don't have to physically be a beggar, but, but uh, spiritually, in a spiritual sense, yeah, you have to be a beggar to be saved. Anybody preaches against that, just cross them out. Just say, I'm not going to listen to this minister of Satan anymore. They're wicked. Um, God wants you broken so that He can fix you. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Just as simple as that. I do pray that you take heed to my warning because there are a lot of false prophets out there. I've dealt with them for many years and they'll mess up the gospel. So that is going to be it. I'm going to put some videos at the end here, some links to some videos. And uh, I guess we'll see you in the next study. Thank you for watching.
King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.